Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm going to talk today about a topic that I call paired pitching. Essentially, it's the idea that uh, you can change the structure of a Major League Baseball pitching staff uh, in a pretty massive way. And before I talk about what exactly it is and the outcome of what you might have if you did it, I want to talk a little bit through the why. So let's see. So let's do a quick experiment. As a thank you for coming and having your lunch with me, I'm going to give everybody in the room $30 million. So you now have $30 million. You don't have to thank me. All you have to do is have one restriction. You have to choose between one of two investments to put all of the money into. So I'll show you a little bit of each investment, and then we can choose. The first investment, the blue pill, if you will, is here. It is a six-month investment from April to October, and the daily returns are, are graphed here. The red pill, the red investment, is also an investment that runs from April to October, and uh, the daily returns are, are graphed as follows. So take a second, and show of hands, who would put their money in the blue investment? Thank you. And who would put their money in the red investment? Interesting. All right, you guys want to see what you just purchased? So the blue investment, guys, you just bought last year's Braves pitching staff. You bought 94 wins, which tied you for first, and then you lost your one-game playoff, so I guess second. Uh, you also were sixth in runs per batter's face, which is a great measure for uh, how many runs you would allow over the season. So that's very respectable. Unfortunately, you had the most volatile pitching staff in Major League Baseball. And that, that issue of volatility is an important one. We'll come back to it. The red pill, you put $30 million into the S&P 500 in April, and you took it out in October. And for, so over those six months, you made a little over a million dollars, just shy of 4%. And if you, uh, if you were to talk to investment managers, 4% isn't great, but it's better than cash. Uh, the good news is that it was ex you experienced extremely low volatility, right? that with the Braves pitching staff, you might pitch a shutout, and then the next game you give up 12 runs. Here you don't see those swings. So why do we keep talking about, why do I keep talking about volatility? Well, it's, it's a really good measure of risk. And what I mean by that is if, if you experience low volatility, if things don't move up and down very much from day to day, you have a pretty good idea of what's going to come tomorrow. Uh, on the other hand, if you experience high volatility, high swings, like with the Braves, you can't really predict what's going to happen th on the next day. So this issue of risk is important. And better than just knowing that it's important, it's better to be able to quantify it. And in fact, we can. So a Nobel laureate, William Sharp, came up with this ratio that I'm sure a lot of you guys know of, especially the MBA, is called the Sharp Ratio. And it's very simple. All it is is your expected returns divided by some measure of risk. And it's usually uh, standard deviation is what uh, the Sharpe Ratio generally uses. So the Braves pitching staff, the Sharpe Ratio for them was 0 0.9. So you can interpret that by saying, for every unit of risk, you received less than one unit of return. The S&P, 4.5 over that same period. So for every unit of risk, you, had, you were received 4.5 units of return, of profit. So 4.5, 0 0.9. As an investment, I think it's pretty clear which one's the better investment. So if you're a graphical person, you can graph the numerator and the denominator as well. <clears throat> you have expected returns on the y-axis and standard deviation, that risk element on the x. And I've just plotted basic um, portfolios or assets you can invest in today in liquid markets. You see cash down on the bottom left. It is the least risky investment because <clears throat> it sits under your mattress but it also returns you the least amount of money because it <coughs> sits under your mattress. On the uh, top right, you've got emerging markets which uh, offer you the highest amount of return. Unfortunately, they're also the riskiest investment. So the average investor would prefer neither of these. They would prefer something so more in the middle, something that maximizes their sharp ratio, that balances out, uh, that maximizes their profit for a given amount of risk. So, in this sense, maybe the U.S. high yield uh, portfolio of, of assets would be the place to go. Now, we're not at a, an investment conference. We're at a sports conference. So can you apply this, this concept that there is a portfolio of assets that are different from one another and you expect a return? Can you apply it to something in sports? 
And the answer is yes, you can. A pitching staff is a portfolio of assets that are different from one, one another, and you would expect a certain amount of return from them. So this is last year's uh, major league pitching staffs. I've changed out the y-axis to a measure of return that's batter's face per run. It's very simple to understand, right? If, it's, if you have a batter's face per run of nine, it means you give up one run for every time through the lineup. Batter's face per run less than that, let's say three, you give up a run every three batters, right? So up is better, higher is better. And again, with, the, with standard deviation, left is better because you're reducing your risk. So there's a couple things I want to point out here on this on this graph. Let's take the Yankees, for example. They have, uh, they have a sharp ratio of one. They have a return of about nine, so one run every time through the lineup. Standard deviation of about nine, sharp ratio one, right? So <clears throat> there are other teams here that also have a return of nine. However, they have inherently more risk. They're farther to the right. So if you were to want a return of nine, the Yankees are your best bet. They have the least amount of risk. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is there's varying degrees of risk aversion or risk neutrality here, right? So let's say I own the Marlins. I'm experiencing very low risk, but I'm also getting low returns. And let's say, my own, let's say I'm the GM, right? And the owner says to me, you need to increase your returns here. You need to do better on the y-axis no matter, no matter what. I might trade you for the Rays pitching staff uh, I'm going to take on significantly more risk, but I'm risk neutral. I don't care about the risk. I'll, I'll do anything possible to move up. Conversely, if I own the Rays and I just can't take those really volatile swings, the shutouts, the 12 runs, it, I'm drinking at night, my wife hates me, I can't sleep, I might trade you for the Marlins pitching staff because I get to reduce my risk, I move left, and, I'm, and I accept the fact that I move down on this graph. This line, by the way, is called the efficient frontier. It's a boundary above which, or to, up and to the left of which, theoretically no investment could exist. It's like an event horizon, right? So the closer to that line a, an asset or an investment is, the more efficient it is. And so that kind of leads me to the third thing that I see here, which is there's not very many pitching staffs near this line. There's three, maybe four, that are close to this line. And that tells me something really interesting, and, it tell, and it's starting to get at the idea of paired pitching. If the, if the standard tr traditional pitching staff was efficient, more teams would be closer to this line. And very few are. I mean, you have, to, you have to draw an efficient frontier around something. And the fact that there's really only three teams that allow you to do that tells me that the very nature, the very structure of a pitching staff is flawed. By the way, those of you who picked the blue investment, that's what your investment got you. That's what you bought. Pretty good returns, a significant amount of risk. So again, pitching is risky. In particular, starting pitching is risky. We heard it yesterday in the panel upstairs that maybe you want to start building your roster from the bottom, right? So you can have risk in the form of injury. You can have risk in the form of leaving a guy in too long. And as a Red Sox fan, I'm going to get away from this slide. <laughs> the bad news is that it's trending downwards, that starting pitching is accounting for less and less of a game now than it was 30 years ago. Why? I don't know why. Maybe it's the money ball effect, right? They're milking the pitch count, uh, getting guys worn out faster. Uh, I'm not here to talk about why. I'm, I'm here to try to isolate one or two effects that might be contributing to this factor. And in fact, there is one effect in particular that you can isolate that gets at why this is all happening. And that effect is the number of times that a batter faces a pitcher in a game. So if I come up against you for the first time in, in a game, you're going to pitch pretty well against me. I come up a second time, I'm going to do a little bit better. I come up a third time to bat, I'm going to do a little bit better. And this effect is significant even when you control for other effects, even major ones like the total number of plate appearances that a pitcher faces. So you run the analysis of covariance for the stats heads in the room, and you can still see this effect. You throw in whatever variables you want to, within reason, and this is still a significant effect. So what are the strategies to try to minimize or mitigate this risk? Well, the obvious one is you find pitchers that don't have this going on, right, that, that actually don't get 
that don't diminish their returns every time a guy comes up to bat against them. So you can, you can try to do that. The problem is that very few pitchers are immune to this effect. So here you've got five very well-paid pitchers, high expectation, and there's only one guy here that actually improves slightly the more that batters come up against him in a game, and that's Joe Blanton. That even Halliday, Lee, Hamels, those guys are not immune to this effect. So that, in my mind, the strategy of just selecting pitchers that don't have this effect going on is not um, a, a, a practicable one. So what else can you do? Well, here's where paired pitching comes in. Instead of making a strategic change in the, in the form of what pitchers you select, you have to make a structural change. You have to use pitchers who pitch less. So the idea of paired pitching, let me get off this for a second. The idea of paired pitching is this. At least this is how I initially propose it. You have, for a given game, you have a pair of pitchers, each of whom pitches exactly four innings. So guy A comes in, he does innings one through four. Guy B comes in, he does innings five through eight. And then you've got some spots in the, in the staff to do the ninth inning, uh, extra innings if there are some. If the guy can't go over, you know, for whatever reason he's getting tagged, he can't do four innings, you have guys to do that. So my, my initial proposal is for four pairs, that's eight pitchers, and then you've got room for these other roles. So now we want to know what would happen on the average on that y and x-axis if we did this. And to do that, you have to, you, have to model, you have to model the returns, right? So you have to use historical data, and you have to make one assumption, that in looking at historical data, I can take a pitcher's per inning data and use his first four innings to model everything. So over the last couple seasons, here are the, the batter's face per run allowed numbers for first four innings and next four innings. But in the case of paired pitching, you would use the first four innings no matter what. So that B pitcher, he's coming in fresh. You have to make that assumption to do this analysis. And when you do that, you find out that this approach will produce more wins. So I introduced this, this topic a couple years ago at this conference as a research paper. Uh, and I got some great feedback and some really critical feedback from one of the scouts. And he said this. He said, first of all, your ace pitchers would never go for this. And I said, well, that's true. It's kind of by design, so that's OK. He goes, well, OK, but here's the problem. So you can't have any of these you know, top of the rotation guys. You're talking about fifth spot guys, uh, long relievers, minor league guys you're calling up or bumping down. You know? And the problem with these guys is they don't have a third pitch that they've mastered. And you need that third pitch to get through the lineup a second time. And when you pitch four innings, you, you, by definition, have to face at least some of the lineup a second time. And I didn't really know how to deal with this, this piece. So, I mean, the obvious one about, like, you, you know, the ace pitchers not being part of your sample anymore, that's fine. I can remove those. I can set a limit to, uh, to how average a pitcher is in the sample, and I've done that. The second piece is the, the per inning constraint doesn't work anymore. In fact, if you go to a per lineup constraint, it works much better. So, in, so instead of a paired pitching system, you have lineup pitchers. And with lineup pitchers, oh, excuse me, let me, um, let me show you how many runs you would save if you did paired pitching. Excuse me. So this is the traditional, uh, this is the traditional pitching staff. You see uh, three stats, batters per run allowed, batters per inning, and innings per game for the three different roles of a pitching staff. You do the math over the last couple seasons, it's simple math, about 700 runs allowed. In paired pitching, you now have eight paired pitchers, a few relievers, and a closer. Obviously, the innings per game in the green goes up, but the batters per run allowed goes up because of this times faced effect. You're reducing the number of times a batter faces the pitcher. And that, you do the math, 650 runs allowed. So you save 50 runs, depending on what exponent you use in your Pythagorean wind theorem, about five and a half additional wins, right? So there's your baseline for paired pitching. Now let's talk about the lineup pitcher. So lineup pitcher, again, you use that assumption that I can take the data from his first, uh, his first time through the lineup and extrapolate that for whenever the pitcher were to come into the game. So again, pitcher starts the game, he pitches the lineup, you yank him. Second pitcher comes in, he pitches the lineup, you yank him until the game, you know, and you just keep doing this until the game's over. So what would happen here? You use the same math, right? Obviously, the innings per game goes up because lineup pitchers are accounting for all of the game. 
And now the batters per run allowed goes up as well because again, you're, you're cutting off that tail of time's face. Now they're only facing the guy once. And you, even though you've removed those ace, ace pitchers from the sample, you still save more runs. You save about one and a half-ish additional wins, so over seven wins above the, tr the average traditional pitching staff. Now obviously, in theory, pitchers would be pitching fewer pitches. They'd appear more, but they would throw fewer pitches in appearance, so they would save on average about 500 pitches, about 20% of their pitches fewer, and that's in the paired pitching model. So now we've, we've talked now through the y-axis, through the returns. And in order to talk through the x-axis, the risk, you need empirical data. And now, fortunately, we have some empirical data. So last season, if you guys aren't aware, the Rockies on June 19th said, our, pitcher, our starting pitchers will pitch no more than 75 pitches. This is not obviously a paired pitching model. It's not the lineup model. But it is a constraint nonetheless. So I think it's useful. It gives us a nice split sample. And we can use it. And when you look at their batter's face per run from the beginning of the season compared to the, the constrained period of the season, you do see a 5% improvement. Again, it's not massive. We're not, you know, we're not reinventing the game of baseball here. But even though it's just a split single season, I would say that's, that's, not, you know, that's pretty decent. Unfortunately, they didn't see the same thing. Uh, they're going to go back to a traditional staff this year. And I would urge them not to. I would, I would say that they're, uh, they're looking at it one dimensionally. They're looking at the y-axis. They're concerned with this 5% returns improvement. They're not looking at how much risk they've reduced, if any. And in fact, they have reduced some risk. They've saved 26. If they did this all season, they'd save 26 runs. So they actually significantly moved left on the, risks, on the risk continuum. They moved slightly up, but significantly left, in my opinion. And again, this is from a very slight change to the constraint they put on their starting pitchers. I would say if they go further in the direction of constraining how much work their starting pitchers do, they would, ev they would improve this even more. So I'll stop, and I, I would love to have some questions. I want to leave some time for that. I'll just say a few things. If you haven't already guessed, I, I would say that this system is not for every team. That, as again, we heard yesterday, if uh, as long as the Hallidays and Sabathias exist and their agents exist in this world, they will still have a place to pitch as much as they want and get paid for it. This is a system, in my opinion, for mid and small market teams who need to save money. And in this way, they can save money on starting pitching. And if they have some surplus, they can go spend it in other areas like getting a great hitter. Now, this is what I presented are two variations on a central theme. The teams, in my opinion, are too risk neutral when it comes to making investments in pitchers. And that they should be more risk averse to their benefit. It's not just about returns, it's about risk as well and balancing those two out. There are many ways to implement this. I hope you guys are starting to think through some of the various ways. I, like I said, these are just two kind of fairly extreme ways to do it. The goal here, for me at least, was to raise more questions than I answer, and I hope I've done that, and I'm very happy to take any questions now, so thank you very much. Uh, your proposal is very interesting. It sounds a lot like a blog post that Dave Cameron wrote on Fangraphs a year ago. I'm not sure if you're aware of it. No. Um, he. Uh, Actually, it's, it's extraordinarily uh, similar, so I, I'll uh, recommend that you take a look at it. It's called a more radical pitching staff proposal. And in it, he proposed, in fact, that there would be effectively three pitchers a game, pitching 10 batters, 38 pitches, um, essentially entirely to take advantage of the th going through the lineup effect mm -hmm. that you mentioned. Uh, he identifies a couple of drawbacks, one of which is leverage situations one of which is the platoon advantage, and one of which is the, um, the number of additional men you would need on a 25-man roster. And for that, he uh, encourages team to, teams to invest in pitchers like Micah Owings, who can effectively go both ways. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's this, a, a further drawback, which is just that we have 
fewer pitchers like Micah Owings even than pitchers like Sabathia. Mm -hmm. So in order to take advantage of this lineup construction, because we have not been selecting for pitchers who can hit for about 50 years, uh, it would be really hard at this point, given the current talent base uh, in the professional baseball ranks, to build a lineup along these lines, unless, of course, you had a $20 million payroll and you just had to. Yeah, so I, I guess I can respond in a couple ways. The leverage piece is a very interesting one, and I, to date, I don't know how you, how you deal with that issue. Um, it's, that's a tough one. Um, regarding the lineup constraint and the fact that you would need more pitchers, I think that, at least initially, that's why I, I proposed that there be four pairs, is that it would cut down on the requirement for more pitchers. Uh, and and I, you, know, you can model out the likelihood of a ninth inning, of extra innings, of a pitcher not performing up to four innings. And it's, it's pretty clear that on the average, uh, you wouldn't have to account for those kinds of situations too frequently. Um, does that answer your question? Okay, good. Uh, <coughs> um, in the past, uh, it's been argued by some people that pitcher volatility is not a bad thing because it can be asymmetric to your benefit. Because if, for example, the average team scores four runs a game, you would, and presumably the average team allows four runs a game, you would choose to take a pitcher who gives up three runs a game every two, no, two thirds of the time and five runs a game one third of the time, and you'd win two thirds of your games, right? Um, in theory. I mean, in theory, yeah, <laughs> and that's also really hard to anticipate, but did you do any sort of like an analysis of correlations between success and volatility like on your graph because the idea I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of those teams with high volatility but not necessarily very close to your mm -hmm. efficient line were extremely good. So if you do a really simple linear regression you do see that the standard deviation is predictive of runs allowed that the 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 larger the it's a positive correlation right that the pot, the more standard the higher the standard deviation the more runs you'd allow. Greg we have uh, time for one more question. Okay. I was thinking of proposing a, an ideal factual situation for implementing this. Uh, wasn't it Earl Weaver who believed that if you had a young pitcher, you should start them in middle relief or spot starting and basically really, really limit their pitch counts? If you had a really broke franchise and they just basically loaded up with like 20, 21, 22 year old guys right at AAA, mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, they'd all be thrilled to be pitching, you know, even 10 batters or nine batters, at, you know, however many. And uh, you could really run the experiment. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. Uh, it, when I envision this happening, I envision two types of players fitting into this system, right? You never have an ace. They would, their agent would never let them pitch in a system that they could never have a complete game. They could never get to 200 Ks, so on and so forth. So you're limited to, I, I think you're limited to two types of players. One are these young, young guys who would much prefer to, to sit on a plane than on a bus and veterans who maybe would be middle relievers or back end of the bullpen guys in a standard system but could actually appear more and feel uh, like they're, they're providing more worth to the team, absolutely. All right, thanks, Greg. Let's give them a round of Thank applause. Thank you, everybody.